So what we do is we eat up the budget, we waste the schedule, and then right before it's due to get to the client, we ask you to build the model. So on behalf of all designers and <laughs> and the IEO guys are standing around saying, you don't know how true that is. <laughs> They're saying that. So, um, I thought I'd uh, try to talk about my view of uh, model making and design. Um, I, this is the title that I wanted to use, which is uh, Model Making Past, uh, Present, and Future. But um, I got no idea about the future, so I'll, I'll talk about the present and the past. I love that, you know that... Um, Everything's attributed to Yogi Berra. I'm not sure he said all these things, right? But, you know, the predictions are difficult, especially when they're about the future. <laughs> I, always, I always like that line. So anyway, um, I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then hopefully have, we'll have lots of time for questions. So, um, model making has been really important to me in my life. It's re been really important to IDEO as well, for some of the reasons I just talked about. but because it's painting a picture of our ideas to the people that we want to convey those pictures to. I look at model making as painting a picture of the future, you know, with our, with our, our ideas in it. And that's how you inspire people, and I think that's what you guys do. It's really important to us. This picture is a picture of um, uh, my first employee and I in the Stanford shop making models in the, early, in the late 70s. We didn't have a shop. <laughs> We had, um, we had two rooms in a building above a dress shop. That was IDEO, and, and uh, we paid 90 bucks a month, I remember. But I remember that it was really difficult. You know, I, we were just starting the company, and, and I thought 90 bucks a month was a, was a good price. And then they multiplied it by like 20 years, you know, 12 months times 20 years, and I didn't have any money. So s signing this thing was a, was a big number if you multiplied out, I remember that. Uh, as being scary. But anyway, so we were lucky enough to, um, we had to build models, that's how we were um, showing our work. And so we um, talked the guy who ran the Stanford shop into letting us sneak into the Stanford shop. I'm sure it was illegal, and we paid him, but I, th I think we paid him legally, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Mitch is there, he probably knows how it is. So anyway, we, um, so we used the Stanford shop, and we were making these models. This is a big climb, the model is, we, structural foam and we were and we were like um, building it in the Stanford shop and then we progressed we got to this this is me <laughs> in the window well outside of our office so we had these two uh, little tiny offices and we needed a shop but there wasn't any space so we saw it was a window well and we we went out there and put some particle board down on the floor and then we put some of that cheap um, you know, fiberglass, green fiberglass stuff, so that it wouldn't, so that we get, wouldn't get rained on, because this is outside. So to get there, you had to climb through the window of the office, right? So, we, you, so to get to the shop, you raise the raise the window and like you know, kind of crawl out one leg at a time, and now you're in the shop. <laughs> Anyways, nacho shop is a little better than this, but not a lot. <laughs> you'll see, you'll see on Monday when you go there. But uh, anyway. So, um, so um, what I thought I'd do is um, kind of talk about a little bit of the progression and hopefully talk um, through towards the end stuff that might, might inspire you to figure out what the future is of model making, but I'll probably stick to the future of design. But anyway, so when we started, it was totally about products. I thought I was going to spend my, I, I'm in Silicon Valley, right? I thought I was going to spend my entire career putting plastic boxes around electronics. That's just, I would have been happy with that. I mean, it would, they were exciting electronics. It was very interesting. But, but uh, I really thought it was going to do. And the, the punchline here is that design has just kept getting broader and broader and broader at what we do, the kind of products we work on, um, and the, the kind of things we do. And, and our responsibility keeps broader and broader. And I, I don't know whether you believe this or not, but model making kind of follows design, at least in some of, some of your fields. Model making follows design, follows, you know, you react to the whatever direction that the design is going to go. So, so I, th I think I can make that tie. Anyway, but, um, so, um, but we, so from a design point of view, 
Uh, 30 years ago, we were doing just products. You know, we do furniture, or we do waste baskets, or we do computers, or we do everything, right? And you would make the models to, to either inspire or to, to validate or whatever. And so I thought maybe I'd tell the story of our, our probably most impactful product and the models that went along with that, which is Apple's mouse. So sometime in the late 70s, Jobs took a bunch of us up to see Xerox Park. And Xerox Park had basically uh, invented the, the um, personal computer, the co computing as we know it, outside of the kind of mainframes that IBM was doing. And for some ways, this salesman, this guy called Steve Jobs, was so good at um, at talking Xerox out of it that we have somehow ended up with all of the all of the technology for this new computer. And I think he gave him some stock, and Apple was all that Xerox Park got out of it. But and so we had lots of things to do. And these, these were really fun years because I don't know how you feel, but I particularly like it when you're designing a product that's new to the world. You know, it's not like, okay, it's a wastebasket and it's, and it's like more beautiful wastebasket, it's a bigger wastebasket, right? And we have a lot of projects like that at the time. But this was really interesting stuff because nobody knew. So we invented the, the packaging for the first laptop computer. And so we got a patent on the fact that the display would come down and cover the keys. I mean, like, I mean, that was common sense, by the way, but nobody had ever done it before. Any, any chicken would have done that if they'd gotten the project, but we had the project. That's why, you know, that's why we got the, the thing. So anyway, so the mouse, right? And so we have to design this mouse, and, and uh, there's a lot of pressure. Mr. Jobs was not the most um, straightforward, nice guy that I ever met. Although I do, so I became, if you've seen my talks or read my book, you know that I was quite close to Steve. Not to tell one story. So, when I talk, I have to warn you, I do these things I call bird walks, where I get something in my head and I just go off somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll, 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 hopefully, hopefully, you'll have to remind me where I was in the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's all on you, Nash. <laughs> 2007, I got diagnosed with cancer. I was the bad kind. I had a 40% chance of survival, according to the, to the docs. And um, I was pretty sick. I survived, just so you know. <laughs> I thought I'd give you the punchline of that story before, before you worry too much. Um, so it's 2007. The, the iPhone is just to be about to be announced. And my friend shows up at my house in, in my sick bed holding a new, uh, a new iPhone for me. I'm your first iPhone delivered by Steve Jobs personally to your house. Pretty special. I wish I could remember it. Um, <laughs> anyway, so he's not a patient man, and so we're, he's sitting by my bedside and decides he'd hook it up for me. So make a long story short, he's calling AT&T and he's talking to him, it's not going very well. Um, I can hear him saying things like, look, you son of a bitch, I'm Steve Jobs. <laughs> I'm sure the guy on the other end was saying, yeah, I'm Napoleon, buddy. <laughs> Anyways, he never got it to work. <laughs> so, 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 we're, so we're, we're working on this, on this mouse, and uh, there's so many interesting happens. Uh, most, this is a, this is a model. This was a mouse for the Lisa. We um, there's a computer that preceded Macintosh called Lisa, which we had responsibility for packaging the whole thing. Apple didn't have an in-house design group. They had a couple of designers, but we were basically their their design group, and we're building this. Uh, and this is the appearance model for what the Lisa, the Lisa mouse is going to look like, right? But we didn't know what we didn't know how people were going to hold it. We didn't know how it was going to work. So this is the first. Um, this is the first prototype of uh, of the Apple Mouse, and it was all. It was uh, we invented this technology. It was a ball that rolled on a on freely rolled on the table, and then there were two commutators. You can see at the tangent point there's these little rollers, and then the, there's a little wheel that spins. It has has uh, you know uh, fabricated has holes in it, and then you just count the. But you have to have one in each direction in order to know which direction it's going. Right? You can't just you just have one. So, um, and this had a butter dish that we bought at Walgreens as a cover on top of it. <laughs> but we just keep learning, you just keep learning more and more different things as you, because 
to me, all of design, and maybe all of model making, is about iteration. So you don't have to be so smart. I don't know why people talk about failing. It's really hard to fail if you're really good at prototyping and iterating, right? Because you've done it, you've showed it to a lot of people, you've showed it to all the stakeholders that are involved, and you've made another one, and another one, and another one. It's just not, um, just not that difficult. It was difficult to su be surprised that people don't like it because you've shown it to so many people and you've built so many of them and you've shown it to the boss and you've shown it to the, all the other stakeholders. And so in this iteration, um, lots of interesting things happen. The, um, so this was the first prototype and this was the second prototype. And the second prototype, we learned something that was uh, potentially fatal, but in using it was in those days, we're talking about late 70s, people had these things called pencils, right? And, and on the top of them was this, this pink thing called an eraser. And they were using them all the time, and that pink stuff got all over the desk. And what was happening was that the mouse was picking, picking up this eraser, uh, this rubber from the eraser, and jamming it up into the optics. It was failing all the time, right? So we had to figure out what to do. So in the end, what we did was, if you remember, for the first 20 years of Apple Mouth, the ball was removable. You turned this ring, and the ball dropped out. That was just a kludgy fix that we thought would never, you know, survive. But the truth is, it just kept going that way because um, it just it made a lot of sense. And it, you know, other things, you know, hair and everything else could go up in there, and so um, that that thing stuck. So um, that so and again, each time you do an iteration, you learn. This is the. Um, this is the pre-production model. You can see there's this part, this black part there, that we call the rib cage. And the rib cage was uh, an inexpensive injection molded part. We're trying to get the cost <coughs> down to like $15. And the, the, this rib cage was um, a way to do that where it, it, kept, it held up all the tolerances and you snapped all the parts into this one part. So it was just this one part. Um, I wish I had a picture of it, I wish I had. So one of our nachos and my heroes is a guy named Bud Delisle, who ran the audio shop forever. Uh, how old's Bud? Oh, pushing 90, 85, something like that now. Still works at Stanford helping the kids with sand casting. And, um, and he, out of plastic, he made one of these. Um, it was the most complex model I'd ever seen. In all, you know, with draft, with all the snaps and everything, and it was in, uh, it was in Lexan or, or uh, plexiglass. And I wish I had a picture of it, but picture that black part made it, and so we did all the testing to make sure that everything was gonna work with that one, uh, that one part. One of the things that really um, was interesting was how to get the cost down. We were constantly coming up a cost target, and they really wanted low cost. And one of the things we were doing was, we were trying to make it really accurate, such that when you move the ball, and when you, I'm sorry, when you move the mouse, it would move, if you moved it an inch on the table, it would move it exactly an inch on the screen. And we were putting all kinds of cost into it in order to do that, because we, accuracy, we were engineers, gotta be accurate. And, and then it became clear in the <coughs> testing, especially with kids and stuff, that if you drew the block diagram, the human brain is in the loop. The human's gonna stop exactly where you want them to stop. It didn't matter, you know, whether you were accurate or not. The brain just kept the kept the cursor moving until it was where you want it to be, right? So we could dramatically bring the cost down of the commutators and they became a little cheap plastic part rather than a, an etched metal part. And that, that was the big uh, breakthrough. Um, we made hundreds of models. When you tour IDEO, you'll see tons of models uh, from the Microsoft mouse or from the Apple, we did the Microsoft mouse after this. Um, the Apple Mouse, and uh, because we didn't know how people were going to hold it, you know, that was a really big, like, are people going to hold this like a bar of soap on the table, kind of like they do now, or were they going to hold it, we could make it much smaller, but they can hold it with their <coughs> fingertips, and you know, you never know. My favorite thing in testing that happened was with kids. So you have kids, and you say to the kid, you want to move, you, uh, you give the kid a task to move the, the, um, the cursor up on the screen. So what's the kid do? picks the mouse up and raises it up like that. <laughs> That's perfect. That makes perfect sense, right? The guy who was the head of uh, this project at Apple had a very small hand. <laughs> and so, you know, like you're supposed to use the fifth percentile, you know, female and 95th percentile male. This guy, he was off that chart somehow. So we never could convince him that we had it the right size. So. There's, you know, no CAD. There's no, there's a removable ball. So. 
The other part that's fun in the, in the model making process for us is the, in those days, is the testing. So one of the one of the one of the wonderful things about new to the world stuff is you get to decide the protocol, the testing protocol. So we decided that the that the protocol should be number of miles until failure. You know, this is a twenty-five thousand mile miles, and this is a twenty thirty-five thousand mile miles, and uh, and so we couldn't figure out how to do it. So what we did. Uh, some somebody came up with it probably in the shop, which was that we made records of different materials, you know, like for mica, wood, and stuff. We put it on this old beat up Pioneer turntable, and we like you know duct taped the mouse to it, and then we had a thing that to determine when it failed, and then we drive it, you know, for hours, and we knew 33 to the third RPMs times you know times so that we could figure out how. So miles to failure was the thing we got to do, which is which is, which is great. So in that's the way model making was for a long time for us. Uh, and design was that we were designing products and, and so the goal was to find the most interesting products you could find in design. And so that's what IDEO really did was try to do that. And we, we did a pretty good job of it. So the way we look at it is we use models in kind of three ways. We probably use models in a lot more than three ways, but this is the way, this is the way we represent it in our PR anyway, is that um, we use them to inspire, to evolve, and to validate. So if you look at models to inspire, um, again, we're painting a picture of, of things for other people to decide whether they want to do it or not. Our clients are deciding whether they're going to bet the farm. You know, we're, we'll, I, I learned a lot when in the old, the old days. So we, we did a toothpaste tube for Procter & Gamble called Neat Squeeze. It was a vertical squeeze tube. It wasn't a, it wasn't a pump, it was a squeeze tube. And we did it for them. And, um, and so we had these three different models and we made them and we put them on the desk in front of the, the big cheese at Procter & Gamble. And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, I like this one. And the guy unloaded on me and never did that again. He said, oh, you like this one. You know that's that means we could sell one to you. That, isn't that isn't that nice? I, I was thinking about s betting the company, building a new factory, and selling 500 million of them. You know, and so like it became clear that it didn't matter what we thought. You know, like you know we used to build these models and say, hey, I like that one. <laughs> you know, it's so invalid now that it's it's great. Um, and so if you look at the stuff inspired, so the thing that the one thing that's a big piece of clay with the nurse holding it. This is a project that we did for um, for uh, for Kaiser, right? And I, I so ended up on the cover of Business Week over this project because it's so the nurses were so underserved as the innovation element in the hospitals. They knew so much, but nobody was asking the nurses. And we went in and started asking the nurses what we thought. And we started building these models and having the nurses build models to have them play act what they would do. You know, if, if the nurses were made god of the hospital, what would they do? That was basically the project. And it totally changed Kaiser Hospital over that kind of thing. The upper left is one, probably the, one of the most famous um, models at IDEO. Everybody at IDEO knows this model very well. In, in a meeting, one of the designers, uh, they, were they were talking, they had a bunch of doctors in the room and they were talking to them about a surgery device, a nasal surgery device. And, um, and they were trying to describe it, you know, there was back and forth, but it wasn't clear what was going on. And one of the guys picked up this, you know, dry erase marker, a film canister and a, and a clip and taped it together and handed it to the doctor and, and said, do you mean like this? And the doctor held it and he said, yeah, that's what it is. And so he's in that moment, I mean, so the, the fidelity or models can go everywhere from that. This is the lowest, crummiest <laughs> model ever made at IDEO as far as we know. <laughs> this, this, this is the bottom end of it, right? And uh, anyway, so, um, so, so when we do, so as, as the design kept moving forward, we moved from doing just products, and you can start to see that we're doing services, we're doing something for Walgreens, or we're designing the way you check into a hotel, you know, and, and now it starts to be that the models are different, you know, right? The models are not just about objects, they're about environments, or they're about about something that's going to be a prop in a movie, you know, I mean, so that we can convey what we're talking about. And that's kind of what's been happening as we move from products um, 
to services and experiences. So those models, though, can be as crummy as you like. They just have to tell the story. Uh, but next, you get to involve. And in this, this iterative nature, you have to advance the kind of fidelity of the models. You have to like answer more difficult questions. You have to be more rigorous about um, the idea. But you're still in the idea. You're still evolving the idea in some ways. And here you can see a lot. We did lots of things and Swiffer-like things for Procter and Gamble in lower left and and the. Uh, the, when you go to our shop, is it still there, the Palm Pilot? So. When you're still there, the first thing you walk in, we show all the, mo there's a thing that must be 20 feet long, a glass case, that shows all the models that it took to build the first Palm, Palm 5. You know, all, you know, just, there's just, there's cardboard ones, and there's metal ones, and there's wren shape, and it just goes all the way down, you can just see how many it is. The ones to carry around to determine weight, the ones to figure out how we're going to glue the metal case together, it's just, um, and people don't, people are amazed at that. They don't realize just how many models, how much work it was to get from, because they, they see this thing, I mean, regular people, I don't know who regular people are, <laughs> regular people, when they, when they see a, uh, when they see a product, they have some notion that it fell out of the bottom of the company. I know, I didn't know, like, but like what it took to get there, um, most people don't really have, uh, have that much of an idea. But anyway, so we use models in this iterative picture to, to, evolve, um, to evolve the products as well. And then validate. And this has always been um, where there's, <laughs> that there's been a rub between us and our clients because to make a real, oh, so the upper left is the, is the final product of the one that was the, the canister and the, and the dry mark eraser in the beginning. And so we're always, um, um, we're always, you know, making sure that the data set is well. I mean, now this is done, you know, kind of by the, by machine, you know, with, with so forth. But for for all of our time, you know, to really prove out that we've got the right design and it's going to work and the tooling is going to be okay and stuff, we have to make those models as well. And there's always a rub because they're so expensive and is it worth it and all that kind of stuff. So this phase is always a dark. And maybe just because we're a design firm, if you're a if you're a company, um, you know you have to make these models. But like, the, I guess the question is whether to keep IDEO around this long and pay us so much to do this kind of validation as well. There's really a funny one, um, like three over and two down, which is Dilbert came to us. Scott Adams came to us and said, we were like these creative guys. Couldn't we redesign Dilbert's cubicle? So if you go online and type in Dilbert's cubicle IDEO, we did a big project, lots of models, all these different, like we had like six or seven different teams and they all um, built different models. And then uh, then he came and they filmed them on, on live on television. So if you go to that thing, you can see the, they're all models that were built like that. <laughs> My favorite, there, there's lots of really cool things. You know, there's your hammock and there's a punching bag that looks like your boss and there's all kinds of stuff in the, in the cubicle. But one of, one of my favorite ones is, there's a, there's a, basically a, a, looks like a real flower, it's kind of an electronic flower. And when you leave your cubicle, it kind of wilts, you know, missing you. And then, and then when you come back, the flower comes to life to greet you when you come back. Into your, <laughs> anyway, so, um, so we talk about today and in the near future. I, I've said it before, but I really think that model making is about storytelling. Um, certainly design is about storytelling. I mean, the truth is our clients are asking us to paint a picture of the future with our best ideas in it, right? <coughs> that inspires them, they can test it with customers, and right? And so, um, in the days of products, I would go in after the model guys knocked themselves out and had this beautiful model, they didn't get to come to the meeting with the president, I wish they did. I go in there, I got a black cloth over the model, you know, and I pull the cloth out and everybody goes, wow, you know, and they were really pleased to do that. If I do that today with the CEO of a company, they give me all kinds of shit because, <laughs> because that doesn't tell you anything. It's just a thing sitting on the table. How are people going to use it? Well, how's it going to have impact on people's lives? That's what they want to know. You know, um, it may be beautiful, but like, tell me its story. Even if it's, again, back to, I don't know why I'm focused on wastebaskets tonight, but <laughs> even if it's a wastebasket, what's cool about this wastebasket? You can't tell from looking at it, right? If it, you know, grinds up the recycles or whatever, you can't tell, right? So our business has moved completely to storytelling. 
So what the audio shop is doing a lot of time is making props for those movies, right? And so um, I thought I would show you some movies. Is that okay? Yeah. So here we go. Can you see them? We have sound. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. You might notice there's some models in there. <laughs> oh wait, that's the wrong one. <laughs> I thought there was something wrong with that music. <laughs> How do I get that to go? It was gone. Yes, it's kind of like push. Uh, that's right. That's right. That's good. No, that's different. That's right. This is Intel. Beethoven. Yeah. So, um, 
So, so what's the future of model making? As I said before, I have no idea. That's you guys' problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I can tell you a bit about where design's going, and hopefully you'll, you'll be smart enough to figure out how to do that. I mean, in this, in this present world with, with movie making, if I was you, I'd be making friends with, with videographers, you know, and trying to understand how to, to help with that part. I mean, um, we're doing much more, we're doing much more under, faking kind of digital stuff, and how, what's, the, how, what's the clever way to make that work, and how much do you do in the shop versus how much do you do in software, and all those questions are things we have to answer in this storytelling uh, phase. But um, as I said, we moved from designing products and services and experience to storytelling, and now what happens, um, you know, uh, I gave 11 talks this week. This is the 11th talk this week. I gave 10 talks this week, not this talk. <laughs> um, other talks, but all the talks are about cultural change. What companies come to IDEA with, the CEO of these companies come, um, and what they want is they want a cultural change for their company. They want their company to be more inherently creative. They want their companies to be able to what we call routinely innovate. You know, that they have the muscles and that that, that company has a culture that allows them to, um, to come up with breakthrough ideas in a systematic way, right? Do we have a, and so the question is, do we have a process? Can we help them with that cultural change? And the answer is, of course, yes, especially if, you, especially if they're willing to pay us, no. <laughs> yes. yes, but the problem is that it's a long-term. The, the, the hard part for us is this a long-term project. So in helping um, big companies change their culture, it's just longer than they want to expect. I mean, we can lie to them and tell them it'll be, you know, it'll be a rel relatively short process, but it's more like 10 years, right, uh, to do that. And so how do we mediate that as designers? How do we, how do we get some small experiments? How do we set a few small brush fires going in their company that hope they turn into a big fire? And so we're constantly doing experiments to find that out. So what I'm talking about now, and, and I just wrote a book with my brother called Creative Confidence. And it turns out that, that we're having really good luck in companies and with individuals at flipping them from thinking of themselves as not creative to thinking of themselves as creative. And the way we do that is experientially, right? And this is where you guys come in. We take them through a series of small successes and they, they end up if, if, you, if, you go, if you have enough small successes, you start to think of yourself as creative, even though you started out not thinking that way, right? And so that's a huge part of our business now. We do this thing called guided mastery. That's this, that's the, we help them master whatever it is that they're trying to do, and that gives them, um, th it gives them that confidence, right? And so, um, I would, so I, I haven't said it exactly, but I've been a professor at Stanford as long as I've been a pro I've, as I've um, start I start IDEO, and uh, the same day I, I started at Stanford in 1978, and uh, it's not unusual for Stanford professors to have companies on the side because they don't pay I mean <laughs> <laughs> they don't pay teachers of any kind enough to have wives who want horses and stuff like that. So, <laughs> so it was a natural thing for me to do to start a company. And anyway, um, so that, um, that Stanford University who um, really never paid much attention to design uh, in, since I was in the beginning, since I, for the first 25 years I was a professor. Um, in fact, when the big shots from the university came down to see me, it was more like, where do you get glasses like that, you know, or where do you buy <laughs> shoes like that, right? So I was the design guy, but I wasn't very useful to the central issues. But today, the reason I'm giving so many talks in this notion is Stanford would like every kid to be confident in their creative ability, right? That they want to be known as a place where the kids there have this thing that psychologists call self-efficacy, that they have a sense of the world and that they can uh, accomplish what they set out to do. That that feeling um, is something that the university wants. And so I now have, instead of asking me what shoes, I now have the president of the university asking that um, 
that we work on this project and you know money's no object I never had anybody say that to me before <laughs> um, just you know get it done such that this is in the culture of Stanford so um, so that's really where model that's I don't know where design model making is going that's really where design is going even broader to the point of cultural <coughs> change how do you actually uh, change an organization to the, it, it could be anything our our goal is around confidence so that's I mean so I'm serious I mean my challenge to you is okay if design's going to e get even broader than it has been from products to services to experiences to storytelling and the next step is cultural change what does that mean to, to model making I think that's something for you guys to figure out I'm going to leave you with one last model so so here it is so I do know has a big relationship with Children's Television Network, Sesame Street. He loves, they have a similar value system to us. Um, <coughs> and and uh, we're not quite as focused on three-year-olds as they are, but pretty close. Um, anyway, um, so, uh, and I, I'll go on a bird walk, one more bird walk. And so, the, um, our, our uh, best-selling app is for the, the two to three-year-old crowd. And we had the insight, early on, many years ago, we had the insight that uh, when you see something that you don't understand or seems weird, that's a, that's a lead for us as we're trying to find innovation. If you see somebody doing something you don't understand, like the, we were working for Pepsi for the first time and we were watching people use, use a Pepsi machine and the woman next to me said, do you think it's right that the Pepsi comes out at your ankles? Right? I never saw that before, right? And that just made that, you can have lots of ideas once you notice that weirdness. So we noticed that parents were giving this very expensive device to their three-year-olds to, to babysit them, right? And so we, we went after the apps for that crowd, for the Sesame Street crowd. And you can see a, there are a bunch of balloon moles and different things. But the one that I'm most proud of is the best-selling app to that by far to that uh, to that age group, uh, targeted that age group. I don't think they're actually buying it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe they progress to the point they can get into the app store and buy whatever they want. I don't know. Amazon, they're buying you know whatever diapers. <laughs> but, um, so picture this, especially if you have kids that age. The app is called Elmo's Calling. So you hand the phone to the kid. And in a few seconds later, the phone rings. It's a little, it's a little play phone set in the center. You, the kid touches the phone, and it's Elmo. And the, you should see the look on the kid's face. <laughs> Elmo's calling me, <laughs> right? and it's FaceTime. So your little pictures in the, your picture of you is in the corner, you the kid, and then Elmo's there. And that probably would have made it a successful app. But here's the killer part of the app. The parents have programmed the app to talk to the kid about what they want Elmo to talk to the kid about. <laughs> Elmo's talking about bedtime. Anyway, so that's the that's it. So I'm going to leave you one more. So with respect to Children's Network, Children's Television Network, the the um, the what do you call it? The Toy Lab inside of IDEO has a completely different business model. Um, most of we do fee for service. We get charged. You know, that's the part where we've used up all the budget by the time it gets to the model makers. Um, that we usually we have a fee, right? But um, but in the Toy Lab, we uh, pitch to the toy companies about every six months our ideas, and then they license it from them. That that industry. Uh, wants ideas from the outside where most companies don't want ideas from the outside. So they, they want ideas. So we pitch to them. Okay, so we had this idea for this 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 kind of dancing Elmo thing and um, but there come, we just had the idea too late. It's only a couple of days before uh, a Children's Television Network shows up. So we got to figure out what to do, and we don't have any time to code. Normally, we do some quick and dirty coding to show them the app the way we want it to be, but we don't know. What, we couldn't figure out what to do. So I submit that model making is incredibly creative in the notion of what do you do? It's not that you just have the skills to use the 3D printer or that you're really good with the with a fadal or whatever. I mean, it's like what what's what's the way that you do it to have the highest impact with the least amount of work and all that kind of stuff and so that's always the problem so here's one of my favorite examples of that so now you've got children's television network coming you got 
you only got a couple of days. What are you going to do for the for the um, music? for the project? This is the vocal dancers who are mastering. And I'm the player, so I come in and I touch the monster, and he gives you a special touch. <laughs> 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 I can go for two minutes, and he does a different one. <laughs> and it can go for as long as I want. If he has a few signature moves. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had enough, and I'm done dancing, I push the back button, and the child moves from these steps. That's me. <laughs> so, so what they did was they got a, on the plotter, they made a big iPhone, cut it out of foam core, and then they just acted out whatever app they wanted to do behind it. <laughs> Thanks. So nice. you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Is that where Sam? You okay with some questions? Or would you like some more water? Yes, I would. <laughs> Thanks. Now, I don't it's, it's not the most important thing in the world. Questions? Any, anything uh, noteworthy happened during your process of your 60 minute interview? Uh, well, it was really interesting, but um, I guess everybody knows this, but I didn't know who Charlie Rose was, to tell you the truth. And Charlie Rose, he was a damn good interviewer. He could, he was like manipulating me, and I couldn't do anything about it. Uh, but when, when sixty min, when they tell you sixty minutes coming, I'm not, it's not all good, you know. I was, you know, I was, I was a bit nervous. Um, but two things that happened, I guess, uh, mostly with my daughter. I mean. So she's 14, so it was really cool that she got on camera. She was in my studio, and uh, when he came to interview me in the studio, and so she was there. So the two things that happened there, w which were interesting there, were, so he asked her what she was working on, what, were, what project was she working on, and at the time we were building, watching the videos, building a printer bot. You remember the really low cost uh, 3D thing? And we were having a hell of a time putting it together. The, he was blocked, the, see, the president, you know the story of this guy? He was, a, he was a minister and he said he could do a better 3D printer so he started doing it and then he raised money on Kickstarter and he had to quit his job as a minister in order to make the 1400 ones that he promised or something. Anyway, and he did a really bad video if you ask me. But, so we were having trouble putting it together. Anyway, so the, the, what they call B-roll, which is, she, she said she was working on a printer bot, uh, and then he, they, they, they went around my shop and took pictures, so they took a bunch of pictures of this half, half put together printer bot. So, the, so, like a week later, the CEO of printer bot calls me and says, gee buddy, thanks a lot, 14 million people watch that show. <laughs> I, I advertised for him, right, on the printer bot. And he said, is there anything I can do for you? And I said, yeah, come down here and make this thing work. <laughs> <laughs> so the, C the CEO comes down, and she, he and my daughter spent like three hours together, like nerding out about the software, the thing. It was, it was, um, it was really good. It's a really, it's a really good thing. Have you ever been in a situation with a client where you've been working on their project, you've been trying to come up with solutions for what it is that they need, and you guys come up blank or it's not complete and you have to tell the client, it's like, we're not there yet. Um, well, well, I thought you were going to ask a harder question. Like, <laughs> yes. well, we're not there yet. We say that all the time. <laughs> we constantly. So I can't draw it because it's not a board, but the client's expectation is you start here, here's a big idea, here's a, a breakthrough idea, and you go straight for it, like there, right? And you know, we're, we're in a six month engagement and it's a straight line from start to you're done. <laughs> what happens with us, with all the need finding and uh, you know, trying to understand people and, and having our insights and stuff, the, the thing, it goes, it's flat for a long time. And now the distance between us and their expectation keeps getting greater. And then, I mean, I'm happy to say IDEO is pretty successful that most of the time it does catch up. But there's that, there's that gap between what their expectation is and ours. It's there nearly 100% of the time. 
So the best thing you can do for that is draw that diagram for the client before you get started. It still doesn't help much. <laughs> <laughs> because they still think, you know, like, I, mean, I love this line. I, I ha I've heard this line a thousand times. Ideo, I thought you were good. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't come up with a snappy answer to that. <laughs> Other than wait. <laughs> what about that culture change? I know you were talking about people um, asking you that culture change. What culture change? Uh, expectations of clients uh, in the design world specifically. Hey, um, uh, and yes. how we are with our own staff. I mean, yeah. some, uh, so, so in some ways, we're blessed. I mean, we, we design the design thing is blessed. I mean, we're moved to way more important in the eyes of CEOs than we've ever been before. It's uh, it's the it's the best time to be in design since I've been in for 40 years. You know, what I mean, so it's really good. Um, still, right? I mean, you know, we're we're. Um, we're gluttons for, for uh, you know notoriety or something. Um, it's still it, yeah it's still a problem that you have this thing that they don't understand. So so my role at Stanford really you know I started something at Stanford called the D School. It was a joke. Is if it was just me and a guy and we're in a room we don't have anything and so we decided to call it the D School because the business school at Stanford is called the B School and it's like really a big deal right and so we decided we'll be the D School they're the B School we'll be the D School and I started getting cease and desist messages from the president of the university saying David you can't call what you're doing a school you're like you're nothing you know like the schools are business law medicine education you, know, like, you can't call yourself as it means something in academia anyways today he calls it the D school. <laughs> but anyways, we're making progress there. I mean, in that, the D school, people from all over the university come there and from companies come there and they and we take them through uh, courses and they figure out what design is. And in our exec eds, we do two a year. And, and those people who have gone through a week-long training in what design thinking is make fantastic clients because they're empathetic to what we go through in the making process, right? And so the more of those people I can jam through this and the more uh, places I can start design thinking, um, you know, institutions where, where we'll be valued, us valued. Hey, you guys ought to be like, I mean, before the maker movement, nobody had a clue what you guys do, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're like professional versions of this movement. I mean, this maker's movement is, I mean, they're not like you. They, I mean, I mean, when you, go, I bet you when you show up at a, at a maker's convention, you're like the biggest hero. I mean, you can actually do this stuff, right? <laughs> so, so I think in the same way that, that movement towards empathy, anybody who's tried to, to, to make something now that hadn't before and they, they're enamored with it, um, we'll start to value the time it takes for us to do things and you know what quality means and you know what me doing it to the hilt means and doing it with rigor means that that's all coming I think as a, as a result of the uh, focus on design and making pretty exciting I mean I don't want to be too Pollyanna but <laughs> <laughs> so was it one type of D school or how many types of D school are we talking about and then how many years is this curriculum and what, what, do you, what do you think this curriculum looks like? Say again about these, what, what? Oh, the D school. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I'm trying to understand what, what, uh, what, what, how many types of D school would there be? Well, and uh, look, look, look at what the uh, curriculum might be. So we've been going since 2005, so I know the answer to what our curriculum is. Um, the curriculum is building creative confidence in people. So we um, we take people from many different disciplines from around the university, you know, engineers and doctors and opera singers and a philosopher, and we put them on the project, and then we give them a pro and then we figure out a project that they're very interested in. We're an opt-in culture. Uh, it's very important to have an opt-in culture if you want to be innovative. So I don't pay the professors; they have to overload it. I don't the stu I don't give the students degrees half the classes the students don't even get um, don't even get credit for but what they walk away with is this uh, incredible feeling that they're a creative person and so that just enables them to go out and try things and are not so afraid of failing and all that kind of stuff so the curriculum is uh, what we call project-based learning. It's project after project after project. If you go on the website and look at Stanford, we've, you know, in, in you know, K 
kids are kids in the D school are starting companies and selling them for a hundred million dollars, and their kids that quit their regular jobs and are now um, saving lives with incubators in the developing world that they've designed that look like uh, sleeping bags. There's people um, who are who are helping people uh, with fire prevention in Africa. I mean. It, see, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not like the do-gooder type. I mean, I, I'm trying to get them to be creative, but I want to feed them projects that turn them on. So a lot of social value projects turn them on. But they're also doing things for lawyers. Nobody really likes lawyers. There's, <laughs> there, there, um, there's a new company called Ravel that just started that helps out lawyers. It was done at the school. So it's this, it's this, um, uh, helping them go through this, have these successes that they are a creative person. It, all the data shows that that some t somewhere about the nine years old or the fourth grade or something, um, kids kids are told by somebody that they're not creative. I think that the people, if you give those people the benefit of the doubt, they're saying you're not artistic, which I buy. You can be not artistic, but saying you're not creative and have them opt out of it kind of is really difficult. The good news, I mean, it really affects their lives. I mean, in my opinion. The good news is when we started the D school, I thought I was going to have to, I was going to have to teach creativity. It's lovely. You don't. Everybody still got it. You just have to take away the blocks that um, that prevent them from be that fear of being judged is the deal. I'll tell you a great story. Um, so one of my buddies is a guy named John Cassidy. He started a company called Klutz Press. If you have kids, you might know what Klutz Press is. These books. Um, his first book was called. Um, the, uh, the juggling for the complete klutz. I should be talking this microphone, huh? Juggling for the complete klutz. And um, it's a funny story about Cass. I love Cass. He, he teaches with me at Stanford now. But I love uh, I love Cass. He thought he was in the juggling business. So his next three things that he came out with were juggling supplies. Failed miserably, right? So. Then he figured out he was in the book business, you know, and the specialty book business, and he succeeded tremendously. He may sold to, to Scholastic. But anyways, juggling for the complete class. Great example. So in that book, um, what he does is he mostly spends, spends time getting you to desensitize to dropping the ball. That your brain is keeping you from being proficient at juggling because you're afraid you're going to drop the ball. Even though there's no consequence to dropping the ball, you still have that. I have this weird fear about missing my airplane. It, you know, like, and it's just an anxiety, and I can't stop it, and there's no, I mean, I could just take the next one. Why is it? It's the same thing. Anyway, so it's just like dropping the ball. It turns out, once you desensitize your brain to that, once you get to the point where you can, you don't, you don't fear dropping the ball, you can juggle easily. I mean, <laughs> you can te teaches you to juggle in about 15 minutes after you get past that, that point, however long it takes you to get that, which is perfect, you know, you can <coughs> go to parties and, you know, entertain the girls by ju juggling with the, you know, the apples you pick up, on it's perfect. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, so, um, <coughs> excuse me, so, the D school's about creative confidence, that's why I wrote the book. And that, I think that's kind of my life goal now is to help as many people be uh, confident in their creative ability or self have self-efficacy as possible. And so that was the reason we wrote the book. You don't make any money on the book. I just thought that, um, see how much damage you can do with the book. I mean, I know if I get, if I get, I know if I get people into a workshop, I can flip them um, almost, almost 100%. But I, I mean, I don't know. About, can you get, get more creative by reading a book? I don't know. I'm not thinking you might, but we'll see. Well, I was just wondering if the model might look good with the designers and, and back and forth. If you notice that there's a tendency along the, the, the design process as models are being made at different phases of it, that designers have a tendency to over design on during certain phases of that the design process to where the model maker gets the, the task of creating the model and we have the designer on us saying, right. well, while you're at it, can you just instead of yeah, waiting that's the next phase. Yeah, to me that's the yes, that's a huge problem. So the more the more arrogant the designer is, the more that happens. And I, and I don't see design like that anymore at all. That's an individual sport. I see design as a team sport now. That's changed. And so once you're on the team, once you have a team, once you have different viewpoints and a designer can't get away with that because there's other people on the team that'll call their bluff. 
when it was just designers in power, kind of, and everybody else, like, you know, not compromising their, their vision, it was a problem, right? But we, that's, in, in more progressive organizations, that's not the case. So, they, so you, you have several people, and if, oh, oh, by the way, you're the model maker, and the three other people agree with the designer, then you're shit out of luck, right? <laughs> but if you, but if, but I mean, but at least you have sanity in the group, right? And so, uh, we also believe that the customer, the user, is another voice in that. So, you know, so, you know, the person, I mean, there are times when you need to go to the to extreme design because the product won't sell or the it won't it won't cap it won't make a raving fan of the person and so you need to go apple you need to go extreme in in that way right and there are times when it's not and so somebody has to make that decision in the thing but um no i think that there are plenty of organizations where that um design uh you know everybody's supposed to follow the design and um and that works for some organizations. I, I'm t totally opposed to that. We move from calling it design to calling it design thinking to make it a, 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 a team sport, basically. So during dinner, we started talking about you had an idea of admitting students into Stanford. Yeah. You know, just grab them from all over the country, free, like a certain percentage, a certain group. Yes. How do you how do you flip? president of the university into that thinking and then how do you flip other universities into following suit well one one thing's really nice about Stanford not to be arrogant and stuff but people follow a, an organization like Stanford right so we don't believe that we have to go out and talk to every university to get this thing going that we go to a few universities and make it work so I've talked to Chancellor Berkeley too about this so the the um, the deal is, as far as I'm concerned, is to um, uh, succeed in some way that gets them. You got to inspire them. The the, end, the good short answer is you have to inspire them. So how do you inspire them? And I think it's this experiment and iteration and you know I mean you know, you you paint a picture of the future again with some video like thing and then if if they don't get it ins inspired you have to figure out why and you make another one you know it's the same as the models right you just make another one until you know it's like uh, until you get to what's Al Gore's thing inconvenient truth or something you get to that kind of video I'm not even sure that inspired enough people but we'll, we're, we'll say it did. Um, you know to in that, in that kind of way so um, I, I may Again, I don't want to be too Pollyanna, but I think life's a meritocracy. You know, you present the right idea, people like agree with you, and then they keep going. So we just keep. I mean, you, you know, my my um, my mentor's a guy, Bob McKim, and he always said to me, always stuck with me, and he said, "A fish doesn't know he's wet." <laughs> right. So we can't actually see. So I make a video that I think is going to wow them. Right. With if I if it's my vision, it's actually the team's vision. But I mean, it's not. Then, um, but but you know, you have all your own stuff that gets in the way of seeing it objectively. Right. But if you show it to other people and you're open-minded and you listen to what you know, like take their feedback and their criticism. Um, and, and process it. You don't just take do whatever they say. You say, maybe they're right. Maybe I need to change this part of it because my own bias is here, right? You do it. So I think it's a meritocracy and you just keep just keep painting a picture of what you think the future is like. I mean, what you want to happen is the people to move to, you want to invent a future that people move towards, right? And they vote with their feet. I mean, it's no, it's not a, you can't, you know, you can't fool them. One of my, I love my students present something and said, here's my video and it's going to go viral. <laughs> I said, good luck on that. <laughs> okay. um, I asked this question to the, the places we toured, which was Autodesk and Lime Lab. Uh, I have maybe my own answer for it, but I'd like to have, hear your answer. What is it about the Bay Area that you could attribute the mindset of, well, we're going to start with out-of-the-box thinking. Yes. We're going to start with innovation. We're yeah. going to, you know, that 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 there's other parts of the country that don't think that way, and they've got kind of, well, we haven't done it. We, we always do it this way, and this is in my forefathers before me, and 
Yeah, it's a it's an open mindedness, but I think again, a fish doesn't know he's wet. I've been here a long time, but my my belief is that organizations in the Bay Area uh, think it's their job to try to do something as innovative as they possibly can and get away with it. Mm -hmm. Like, what can I do in the presence of my boss that's as innovative as I possibly can and not get punished for it, right? I mean, like, um, you know, where, where's the, trying the limit? My fear is that in most organizations, in a lot of organizations that are not, that don't have that mentality, it's more like inactivity is good. Like the, 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 the mindset is, if I don't do much, you know, if I don't push, if I don't do something that I could get punished for, I'm going to be much better off. So I'm just going to stay this center course. So it's innovative because the mindset is um, to try to push the limit uh, of what you can do and still, to still get there. One of the things that's, that's the best thing that's come back from the book, as far as people coming back to us, is us, our notion of double delivering, which we help a lot of companies, individuals and companies do. So um, you're afraid to do something that's out of the norm, or you're afraid to get judged by your company. Do some, the, especially the young people have a lot of energy. Um, we've had great success with double delivering. So you do it the way that you would normally do it, and the way that you know will be will uh, please or placate senior management, right? And then you do it some other way. You do it. In, you do it in this in the, the way we're trying to teach them with this, which is this. Um, you know, radically collaborate with some other people and talk to users and do something differently, and then deliver. And what's happened is that it's really hard to ignore if you're the boss, so to speak. It's really hard to ignore that this person did their job, and then they did this other thing that's quite interesting. And pretty soon, not that they adopt the other thing, but pretty soon that person is has a more creative job. That that person is asked to do more creative tasks inside of the company. So that seems to be working. So kind of along that same lines, I think, how how much or when do you concern yourself with the manufacturability of a product? You know, There's always manufacturability from the beginning on every project. I mean, that person's on the team. Okay. <coughs> they also have to be open-minded too. Mm -hmm. It's like <coughs> you can get bad manual. You can get j just cons be being concerned about being rigorous and having the details doesn't ensure anything. That person has to be open-minded about what what they can do. How can they push the limit? How can they go back and then just say to saying that's t that's you know that's um, <coughs> that's too costly or you know being a curmudgeon about it, which they have a reputation of being sometimes. They have to be on the team. They have to like sign up for it and th to be. True, they, they do. I mean, they, once you get, it feels good to be on this more, you know, this more kind of uh, successful team. And so they, you know, some people don't uh, flip quick easily. But, um, but yeah, no, I mean, um, again, um, I mean, I don't want to sound like it's easy because it's not. But if you if you make it a team sport and everybody's there and you just um, you just don't let people, you don't just don't let people. Um, you know, say what's wrong. You can only build on each other's ideas. You can't actually just, you know, the cultures where somebody says something and, you know, says, you know, that won't work because, and then everybody is admires them for being so smart, that won't, that kind of culture won't work, you know. That, so, th you think of our, in our culture, you're only, so, somebody says something, you say, that's not going to work and stuff. You're not allowed to say that out loud. But you think it, because you're human, you, we're really good at finding fault with other people's <laughs> ideas. And so, you think that, but then the next thing, that, the only thing that's allowed to come out of your mouth is a solution to that problem that you were just so smart that you dreamed up, right? That doesn't work because, in your mind, and then you say, okay, so it doesn't work, I'm right, well, how, how would I fix it so that it would work, given my insight, and then that's what comes out of your mouth. So, it's pretty subtle, but it um, makes a big difference. If you were your Sam's own husband. Yes. Sam. <laughs> 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 um, if you were your own client, what product would you like to design for the future? Um, I'm I'm all about K twelve. I mean, uh, my my personal passion is K twelve, so I want to get in there and do. Um, you know, something about homework or something about, you know, how we, uh, 
how we uh, torture our kids with grades and stuff to get to, to go to college and stuff like that. I can't tell you. I think I should probably stop here, right? But let me. T I'll tell you one story. So we did get a dream job, which is the San Francisco Unified School District asked us to look into lunch. There's a long reason why they picked lunch for little lunch. So we go in there and we do our normal thing and we do lots of uh, you know sort of. Um, you know, uh, anthropology, we watch the kids, we talk to the stakeholders, we talk to the principal, then we interview like 300 people, we talk to the, you know, the school board, and we talk to the people who serve lunch, and, you know, talk to the kids. Pretty clear nobody's talked to the kids. And when you go into the lunchroom, so lunchroom, lunchroom's like a big gymnasium, and there's a couple hundred kids in there, and they're, and the adults are all screaming to, to be quiet. Like, What's that about? I mean, like, you can't put kids in a gym and ask them to be quiet. I mean, like, that's <laughs> the only hour they get to be yeah. free. So. Anyway, so when we, when we go in and look at it, it's pretty clear that, well, first, when you, when you so we do lots of observation, not just asking. Because when you ask the kids, their solution is really clear. Ice cream all the time. <laughs> if you just start serving ice cream when we come in and you do ice cream for the rest of the time, everything will be just fine. <laughs> um, but you know, that's not that's not actually but so when you when you get when you get to the to the the kind of non obvious needs, you know, the things that, that you really want to work on, it's clear that lunch is not about food for them, it's about socialization. They're, they're there, they've been with, their, with the people in the class, but their friends, when they get to the, when they get to the, to the lunchroom, they want to be with their friends, and they want to like, have as much time to kind of talk and be together as possible. So what they're doing now is they're standing in line, right? And, and then they get to be with their friends after they wait in this long line, they got like say 15 minutes where they get to be with their friends and then they're back to class, right? So that's the thing to redesign. So we reframe it from lunch to designing an, an exceptional social experience in that hour, right? Now, so in the reframe, in the understanding the need, is the, that's the most creative part. The problem solving, people talk problem solving. It's, we're pretty good at problem solving. We're not good at is need finding. What problem is worth working on? And so now we've reframed it, okay? 53,000 lunches a day are served there. So, so now, now you go to work, you figure, you, so, you, so when the kids come in now, the kids, um, when the kids come in now, they go right to a table like you guys are sitting at with their friends. They sit there. The servers are taken out from behind the, the sneeze guard or whatever that thing is, and they're, um, and they're serving, and the kids are help serving, and it's like this big thing, and, it's, uh, and so they go right to the socialization the second they, they come out. And here's one of the big wins. It's, uh, schools are federally subsidized if you put enough uh, fruits and vegetables on each kid's plate. And sometimes there's a federal guy standing there to make sure that they put it on the plate. But not that you eat it. They just throw it away. So anyway, so in our system, in our new system, the kids are sitting at the table. They come in, they sit down. We serve the fruits and vegetables first. There's nothing else on the table. They're totally hungry. They eat the fruits and vegetables. <laughs> 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 that's a, that's a huge, that's a huge win. And so um, there's all kinds of other little things like um, you just watch. I mean, you know, it's so. Uh, this is common sense. You sit there and watch, and there's a stigma associated with the people who don't have to pay for lunch versus the kids who do have to pay for lunch, right? And there's a stigma about that. And so the kids, the poor kids, a lot of times don't even eat lunch because they don't want to go through that. So we got a system now. There's a card. You come in, put your card in the system. Come out. Nobody knows whether you're getting a bill or not. Everybody's got the same card, right? So there's that. The, the, you know, the, in doing this kind of work, when you base it on the human side, our, our process is called human-centered design. If you look at the process, there's always some moment that seems to be exceptionally human. And this was no case. <clears throat> this was the case as well. There's, we're standing there, and um, one of the teachers sees a kid putting food in his backpack that's not legal in their system. So goes over to the kid and says, what are you doing? The kid says, my mom's hungry. Right? So our new project is really cool, which is, you know, <laughs> dinners that you can take home, and the same federally subsidized deal, the kid can take dinners home to their family, you know, if we were in some, and again, you can take dinner home to your parents, and it's really good food, I mean, certainly it's really healthy. Now, the, you know, you can, if, even if you're rich, you can take dinner home because you got this card that you put in and it, uh, it charges you for it or whatever, so, anyway, so, 
So anyway, so K to, the answer is more K-12 is what I would do if it was totally up to me. Okay, should I stop there? Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.